Welcome to MRTV's People in XR. This is the podcast that introduces you to the most exciting players in the industry. And here is your host, Sebastian Ong. In this episode of the People in XR podcast, it is my utmost pleasure to say hello to Chi Zhu, who is the founder and CEO of Unreal. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm very well. I'm really glad that we uh, that you have the time for this episode of the podcast. And I'm so excited to talk about your products with you and, of course, also how you became the CEO and founder of Unreal. So first of all, for all of our viewers and listeners who don't know yet what Unreal is doing, could you tell our um, listeners what Unreal is producing? Okay, sure. Um, hey guys, so uh, this is Chi from Unreal, and we are basically building uh, mixed reality glasses, and we're going to deliver the next generation user experience. Right. And you can see, um, basically, we are building something that is truly light formed and uh, small. Yeah, it looks it looks really not huge, not uh, it's not comparable to like the Hololens or the Magic Leap One, and uh, you did that on purpose, I suppose. Yeah, of <laughs> course, and that's not an easy job to do. I think so. Yeah. So, tell us a bit more about your product. These are the uh, Unreal glasses, or yep. do they have a special name? Uh, we call it Light right now. Light, Unreal Light. Yeah, probably because they are not so heavy. <laughs> right. Uh, so if you look at the, the definition of light, there's basically two different definitions. One is this is very lightweight. And the second one is we actually have a stunning display as well, kind of representing the different color, colorful and uh, great display. So that's kind of the whole thing we're trying to do right now. And uh, we believe people are really sensitive to the stuff they put on their head. So it has to be lightweighted, you know, compared to all the other existing uh, has said they're basically homelets, right? right. So uh, for both VR and AR, and people can't really wear that for a long time, and that doesn't really feel comfortable. So um, we don't really think that's the, the solution for either the consumer or the enterprise as well. So that's why we came with this one. We think, okay, we have to draw a line, and this has to be very, very comfortable and very lightweight. Okay, so these are augmented reality glasses, which means you see the reality, but you will superimpose a virtual picture that you can see in your reality. And these glasses, they will also detect your reality, your environment, and it will interact with the virtual objects, is that correct? Exactly, so um, we can, so Google Glass is very lightweight, but the kind of functionality is not good enough for people to wear it and to be addicted to that. So we have to make sure that not only this is very lightweight, it also has been very powerful in terms of the experience and the display as well. So uh, that's why even it's small, we managed to package a great display, very vivid, colorful display, and also a uh, full-scale six-off tracking and spatial computing kind of capability as well. Wow, how did you put this into this little package? <laughs> this is quite amazing yeah. engineering, I would say. Right. So, <laughs> so honestly, we it, it takes a lot of work, and yeah. we actually iterate seven times okay. within two years to make it that small. Right. So, if you look at the very beginning, the all the early prototypes, they're very big and heavy as well. Mm -hmm. So, we we figure out okay, you know, even though this is not easy job to do, we have to keep pushing the line and make sure that people can finally find something that they truly want to wear, even if it's not turned on. Wow, that is really cool. So these are really made for consumers, not just enterprise. Exactly. So we just want to make uh, great uh, glasses that people can wear, whether it's for uh, consumer or enterprise. Mm -hmm. Both. So, yeah. Okay, great. So if I buy them, what will I be able to do with them? And how do they actually work? I see you have different kind of uh, things that they can connect to. Yeah. Probably you can... Uh, oh, yeah. So this is a great question. So uh, we want to make sure that this is not only very, very lightweight, but also very accessible. Meaning, so this is basically a Type-C port. Mm -hmm. So you can... Uh, we want to support a wide spectrum of different devices. Mm -hmm. Namely, say, a cell phone, our own compute pack, or even a laptop or desktop. So the good thing about that, we want to make sure this is cross-platform devices, whether you can uh, 
so for different use cases, we can support all of them. Say a cell phone, you have basically on the subway, you can tether directly to the phone and watch a movie, or you can uh, tether to a laptop that have some uh, training videos, and you can basically render a really complicated 3D model in front of you. And um, it can be running on Android or Mac or Windows, whatever. So that's kind of our goal. Cool. Yeah. So it means, for example, I'm on a long bus ride and I want to watch Netflix, I simply connect this to my phone and I have like a virtual display floating in front of me. Of course, yeah. That's that's amazing. That is really cool. And you have like basically 200 inch TV in front of you. Wow. That's just a tiny <laughs> screen, right? Yes, that's really cool. So um, actually I have tried these out mm -hmm. in uh, CES in Las Vegas in the beginning of the year. Yep. And I think at, at, at that event, you really like uh, you exploded onto the scene and nobody w knew about you. I, well, right. I didn't know about you and then yep. you were there. Yep. And <laughs> I tried the device and I was like very excited about it because the picture looked so strong yep. as compared to the competition, yep. which had been working on this for longer and probably even better funded than you. So that was really like a big surprise for me when I when I saw that at CS. So I'm wondering how could you pull that off? So I know I know that you guys are probably um, how long are you exi existing? Like three years or? Uh, yeah, a little bit over two years actually. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit over two years only. Yeah, <laughs> that is unbelievable. So um, how could you pull this off? This is really my question. Like, okay, let's let's um, say it out loud. Magic Leap had been working on this for like so long it seems like felt it, it feels like they have been working on this for very very long now you've been working on this for two years and it seems like the picture quality actually looks a bit better than what i saw at magic leap well <laughs> um okay so uh, uh that's a complicated question to answer uh, i think honestly for the record magic leap or even hololens they're doing a great job of course, I don't want to make them look bad, but it's just like it's right. surprising. They me. had they had great technology and great yeah. people, and exactly. been, I think they are doing something that truly driving the whole industry going forward. So um, that's for the record. Yes, but absolutely. On the second second part, I think they sometimes you know they're too ambitious. Mm -hmm. They're trying does a little bit too hard. Okay. So that's why um, I think in, in some way they're trying to build something that can replace a cell phone in the first generation, okay. which is kind of like a mission impossible. <laughs> so um, with that kind of, uh, you know, intention in mind, what they're trying to do is they're trying to bundle pretty much everything in the helplet, making right. them bigger and bigger. Right. So we're trying to come up with something smaller, which will make our job actually easier because we want to do the, we want to add, we want to do everything, say, we actually just want to make sure that, okay, we do several things right at the very beginning that people okay. truly find that interesting. And then we can add more and more stuff on the list. Right. So what they're trying to figure out is, okay, we need to have a stunning display and a great mixed reality experience. Right. But maybe not no depth sensor at the very beginning, no eye tracking at the very beginning, that people might be okay with that, you right. know, in the first generation. And we also want to, uh, we basically want to say we are not replacing the cell phone. So this actually makes our job a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna say, why don't we just complement the phone? Mm -hmm. Say people are not gonna get rid of the phone in the you know, next three to five years. Mm -hmm. So uh, why don't we just accept that and make that better experience with the phone? So that's why we come up with this idea. We can tether to the future phones or we can tether to a laptop. So we're making that whole experience better. Wow, that's a very good answer. So you simply don't want to be too over ambitious, and also you you don't have this pressure of Magic Leap, I suppose, right? They are a bit under pressure <laughs> to deliver this um, device that totally gets rid of the f of the phones and stuff. And yeah, you simply make a device that is more interesting probably for the consumer right now, since it just complements the stuff that is there. Right, exactly. So we talk to a lot of people in the whole ecosystem, like content providers and operators and OEMs. Uh, what they're what they're getting out of this is okay. They don't really see a media take off the consumer market for AR because all the devices in the market right now they're too bulky, mm -hmm. and they're not likable f from the customers. So, so we're trying to do something that change people's mind mm -hmm. because we truly believe this is actually going to take a lot of sooner than people expected okay. for the AR to take off, and we just gave them a perfect example for that. Wow! So, um, when do you believe that AR is going to take off? Okay, uh, that was probably the first time I saw the Magic Leap demo. Okay. 
So just for, for the record, I used to work there. Yes. Uh, I used to work there as a software engineer working on the, the tracking stuff. And it's an amazing experience for me. Right. And I learned a lot from the people from the whole company and their vision as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, after that, I, I'm a true believer of AR, mm -hmm. and I think that's definitely going to take a lot sooner than people expect it for this to take off. So I want to be part of that, for sure. You are. Yeah, of course. And um, that was probably 2015. I realized, okay, this is kind of like opportunity for, for every 10 years. Yes. You know, you see this um, platform shifting paradigm, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we want to be part of that. And back then, I realized, okay, we have some advantage in China mm -hmm. because if you look at the supply chain, the, the manufacturer capability, that's something actually um, the U.S. or the, the rest of the world don't have. Right. So we can iterate so fast, you know, and the people work so hard uh, compared to the other part of the world. And that's why I want to go back to leverage that. Perfect. So... Um, because we do realize that, okay, it has to be very affordable for the consumer to take off. And uh, what you know the other competitors are doing right now, they're just way overpriced. So, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but that's not a good sign for the consumer to take off. So we have to make sure, we have to find alternative solution and technology path to make sure that, okay, this can be more affordable. And that's why we're building something like this. Good, so how affordable is this? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. We haven't figured out the price oh, really? point okay. yet, All but right. it's definitely, definitely under a thousand bucks and maybe a lot more under that. Right. So, um, okay, let's make it $499 now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't say that, <laughs> but we'll try. We'll try. Okay. And um, the whole point is, okay, if you look at the whole supply chain, it's not as mature as, you know, the cell phone business. For sure. So uh, there's still a long way to go, but we think we can be a pioneer driving the mm -hmm. whole, you know, industry going to the right direction. Great. So um, for this device, tell us a bit more about when is it exactly coming out and uh, what are the options to buy it? Like probably with your own pack the, the computer or without so yeah, yeah. that's a bit more okay cool so uh, we do plan to have this available uh, q3 this year mm -hmm. uh, but we want to make sure that not only we can provide a perfect hardware we can also bundle that with a great uh, experience mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that's why we're talking to a lot of content providers that's why we're we're being here mm -hmm. talking to more independent uh, developers as well to make sure that once we launch them we have great content pair with them mm -hmm. at least you know we have you know, several killer apps at the very beginning. So, uh, and also we do have come with two different options for the purchase. Uh, so we, we have our own uh, compute pack that's running a Qualcomm with 45. And um, also we have the capability to have just the glasses and the controller where you can tether to a uh, to, uh, phone. Yeah, right. Because most people already have like a very good phone. Exactly. So probably they, they, they can save some money and not get your computing unit and simply directly get the glasses. Um, would, so you are able to, to, to see what's happening on your phone, right? So then probably um, Google has just announced their Google Stadia. Have you heard about it? It's their, the, the, compu the computing, cloud computing. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's like, a, it's like a cloud computing platform where you can play all kind of games through the cloud. So probably you can also play that on the phone then and have it on the two screen. Of yeah. course, yeah. Actually, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, if you think about 5G, mm -hmm. where you get, you know, even you know, bigger throughput and lower right, latency, right. you can actually put a lot of stuff on the cloud as well. Exactly. So that's not only Google. If you look at all the major chip makers like NVIDIA and Qualcomm and Intel, they're all doing the same thing. So I think that's actually going to be the mainstream. And that's also a good news for the glasses because we can, we can basically uh, put the, the, the compute and the power for that part to the cloud and make the glasses even smaller. Wow, that is really cool. Where is it going to be available? Is it going to be worldwide launch or is it just the States? That's a good, good, great question. So uh, we're targeting a global market, but we haven't figured out the priority yet. Okay. So uh, it can be at the very beginning, either the US or the Chinese market or uh, Korean or Japan. Right. So we do realize the Korean Japan market can be very, very exciting at the very beginning as well. Right, they are very much into this stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> of course, right? Yep. So, so that might be exciting, but I believe also in the Western markets, I believe in the West, we also like it. Since it's, yeah, it looks cool, it's different. 
different than the ones that are yeah available right now. So that's definitely cool. Yep. Cool. So third quarter, different kind of options to buy it with the computer or without. Plug it to your to your phone or to your laptop, and you can see the stuff there. Yep. Cool. How about the, um, the content that you want to bring on the platform? If you don't want to use your own um, smartphone um, content, are you going to have some first-party things, or are you working together with game developers? Are they going to be games just made for this? That's a more? great question. So um, I think there's two major scenarios we're targeting at the very beginning. It will be uh, entertainment and productivity. So um, it can be gaming, it can be some movie watching experience. Um, it has to be new, right? So and also maybe some social and some shopping kind of capability as well. So we are working with some content providers and partners to get those out uh, by the same time frame when we launch them. And uh, in the meantime, we're gonna make sure that okay, we provide a very mature SDK where people can easily pour some existing content you know, on some other platform onto ours. Mm -hmm. A great example to show is at Mobile World Congress earlier this year, we actually showcased the content with Next VR and our Visio, and they actually have those kind of content previously running with some VR headsets or HoloLens. So it took less than 10 days for them to pour their content onto our platform. Ah, great. So, so those developers who are probably now working on Magic Leap or HoloLens um, apps, they can simply port them course, to your yeah. to your devices. So well. guys, if you are watching and you wanna you, you like this kind of setup, so uh, let us know. Shoot us an email and sign up with our uh, early developer program. We'll okay. let you know. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to put the link in the description below so you can directly find them. Cool. Um, one use case that is interesting for me personally, like I, I, I like to watch YouTube, right? I'm yep. a YouTuber and I like to watch other shows. Of course. So I could probably uh, wear this and I could like make huge um, screens and put them on my wall. Of course. Yeah, th this stuff, I love it. Yeah. So you can have these virtual um, virtual screens floating on your wall and they will stay there even if I walk around, right? So, of course. Oh, that's, this is great. This is like a really cool use case. Yeah, and if you go out and come back. It's going to be there. It's going to be there. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Wow. So I can have my whole apartment full of the virtual. You can, you can decorate <laughs> your whole apartment, whatever you like. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I, the AR future is going to be unbelievable. Exactly. What do you think? Um, what is your vision of the AR future? How is our life going to look like in five years? Wow. Okay. So five years might be too short. Say, okay. let's ten, say, ten years. let's say ten years. Ten years. Okay. okay. I think you know. There's mainly, in my opinion, there's two phases of AR. So in the first phase, you know, this is a glasses form factor that people will find very interesting and they would love to wear it for some use cases. But that's still pretty heavy compared to the regular glasses. Mm -hmm. So you only wear it for why you use it. So I think the second phase is once this get you know lighter and lighter. And it will be just uh, very similar to the regular glasses. People are just gonna wear it all the day, all the time. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, all the notification, all the um, all the AI stuff, you can just have them, and the people are gonna soon realize that okay, we cannot live a world without the glasses. <laughs> yes, like and now we cannot live without our mobile phones. Yeah, and, exactly. Right, like if I forgot my mobile phone at home, it's a bad feeling. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So, so, but for that time, you can realize okay, that's probably the only devices and the only screen you need, right? right? You don't need a TV, you don't need a cell phone like that. And I think we could definitely have that in 10 years. Wow. That maybe is, maybe sooner than that. That is interesting. So what I personally envision is a world where there's a huge AR layer above everything. Of course. But, uh, of course, exactly. Yeah. There's no question about it, right? So the question is then, which layer are you going to turn on with your Unreal glasses? Is it going to be the Facebook layer, the Apple layer, or perhaps the Unreal layer. So then in that moment, you also have to become a platform player or not? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so we do want to be that player. Okay. okay. Once, uh, if we can be that big, I mean, we can, we can survive that the kind of competition. We definitely want to be there. And we're going to show what we vision for mm -hmm. the future, for that kind of universe. Yeah. Wow. That's going to be a very, very exciting time. But then, um, like, uh, probably we're going to be some kind of AR augmented superhumans, those who have those glasses, and uh, the people who cannot afford them, yeah, well, it's going to be tough for them, right? To compete against people who wear these glasses. And if I see you, probably the AR cloud's going to tell me, hey, this is G, and he is uh, 39 years old or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, that's why we have to make sure this is <laughs> affordable for exactly. everybody. You're right. Yeah. Right, you're so right. we want to make sure that everybody can enjoy this kind of experience and mm -hmm. they can leave a word, you know, 
for the future. Yeah. Right. I think it's going to be very important and probably it's going to be the same like smartphones who are so affordable right now that nearly everyone can get them. Of course, yeah. Okay, cool. A very exciting talk. And now I would like to understand more a bit more about you. Okay. About um, how did you become the founder and CEO of Enreal? So you tell us a bit more. Okay. About you you can you can never be ready for this kind of stuff, you know. So um, um, it took me some time to figure out whether we're gonna do this or not. But the whole thing is okay. Uh, I want to make up my mind. Uh, to, I think the turning point is uh, if I don't do this, I'm probably gonna regret for the. The rest of my life and um, if I don't do this someone else will do that so um, yeah so that's why I kind of pull the trigger wow. and uh, try to start looking for my team it, it doesn't um, so when I left to Magic Leap I took a break um, so I basically go to the I talk to people and try to figure out okay what is my next step and um, it didn't really occur to me that I'm going to be a CEO and founder for a company because, you know, that's a lot of things to take. Yeah, and I'm not ready, even though I, I always want to be an entrepreneur sometime in my life. But I, I just don't feel I'm ready. But after talking to a lot of people, especially some of my, my early investors, and they kind of encouraged me. And um, they kind of, um, so you're, you, as I mentioned, you're never too ready to be a, to be a leader. And you have to learn all the way through, you know, um, there are always going to be different roles for you as a CEO. So, um, yeah, just learn through that. And I think luckily we have a, a lot of entrepreneur friends and mm -hmm. they give us a lot of uh, advice. And um, I think another thing is, okay, um, China and U.S., they're, they're having a quite different lifestyles. To be yeah, honest. yeah, of course. Yeah, because I was different. I was in the United States for nine years before I came back, and I do realize that people are a little bit more aggressive in China, for and sure. once they see they see this opportunity, people get really really excited, That's and they're willing to put more effort into this. Right. So I'm just lucky that I met with a lot of great people that are willing to do this with me. Wow, that's very exciting. Yeah. So, um, you went to the states to study, probably. Yeah. And you study engineering, or right? So my background is uh, electrical engineering. Oh, so I got <laughs> yeah, I got my PhD in Minnesota. And All right. After that, I, I came to uh, Bay Area, and to pursue my career. And uh, initially, I was working on the the architecture of CPU and GPU stuff. That what gives uh, me a uh, kind of a system uh, perspective of the whole stuff. And then uh, I think the magic gave me some uh, some great great vision and knowledge about AR in general. And so we kind of leverage both of them, um, and it truly helped me a lot. Wow. But um, working there and then um, starting a company, it's, it's completely different. I mean, to, to of course, for yeah. yourself to start something up like Unreal, it's not easy. I mean, did you have a good network of um, people that you knew in, in China, in the entrepreneur scene? Or how about, um, did you know already how to find investors? Well, that's a good question. All these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As you can see, I was in the States for nine years. Right. So basically, all my connection is in the United States, pretty much. So uh, when I first came back, that's why it took me some time to talk to people, to get to know the people. Uh, to get to know the whole industry in China, I realized okay things are operating slightly different in the U.S. and the China, uh, in U.S. and China. So um, it was not easy at the very beginning, but I think actually that's a good thing because you manage to talk to more people to polish your idea, your business plan going forward as well. So uh, as you can see, uh, I was back in the um, so I was back in China. I think uh, in the middle of 2016. And the company got started uh, early 2017. So it did take some time. Right. How did it look like when you were you went back to China? You spoke with um, who? With um, with uh, finance? With financiers or yeah. with, uh, venture capital? Yeah, there's some uh, venture capitals and great people. Beijing and, or um, Beijing, Shanghai, even Hangzhou. Okay. Different places, and um, I think you know uh, for the. Uh, entrepreneurship in China, they're they're very very. Um, I think in general they're very healthy. So somehow people would love to take chances, other than just go to the big corporations, and um, they actually learn a lot through that whole process. And that's why it's easier sometimes to start a small company and convince people to join. Um, we literally start from scratch, 
uh, we our first office has only uh, seven seats there. All right. So uh, so I still remember at the time we actually opened that room and then we kind of expanded <coughs> along the way. Say one room, then two offices. And we kind of uh, do three, and then we make a bigger room to have like about twenty people, and keep growing, growing, and we keep switching places. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, luckily for us, there's some uh, incubator in the in China as well, and they're very friendly, and they can sustain that kind of change, you know, in a short amount of time. And um, later on, we have right now, I think we have eighty people. Mm -hmm. So cool. and we're still expanding. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. I'm just wondering, isn't it hard to convince venture capitalists about an AR startup? Because AR is still so new and nobody really understands it. <laughs> I mean, the normal yeah, people. That's a very good point. Right? Like nobody yeah. knows. What is it? Even for VR, it's not so easy. But AR is even more in the future. Exactly. Especially if you, uh, you know, back then, uh, if you talk to the investors and, you know, you have a perfect example ahead of you that Match Leap that raised tons of money but haven't released a project uh, product <laughs> yet. Exactly, exactly. So that, that's not some easy <laughs> argument to make right. when you try to convince the people why you can do this. Mm -hmm. But um, I think luckily we just find some people that truly believe in us. They see Maybe they see something in our eyes and they think, you know, those kind of young people, they, they, they have a guts and they might know uh, something about this industry and they can pull it off, I guess. Wow, congratulations to, to pulling this off. To get to this point is amazing already. I Thank think. you, but there's still a long way yeah, ahead of obviously, us. Obviously, yeah. obviously. So then you got the money, you formed a team, yep. 80 people now. Yep. That, that's quite a lot for the beginning. So um, tell us a bit more about um, your company culture. Well? And the differences between a Chinese startup and a startup in the US or in the West. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a hard question because we haven't really write us down about what kind of culture our company is. Oh, really? So new. Right. So uh, we're still figuring that out. Okay. We're going to make sure that, okay, it's not something we write it down mm -hmm. or maybe we try, uh, we truly find it from oh. ourselves, mm -hmm. deeply inside. So uh, so we're kind of taking that slow and uh, intuitively we're trying to figure out that. Um, what time do we have? Do we still have time? I can cut it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. We can probably have another like 10 minutes. That would be amazing. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So, uh let me get back to this one. Uh company culture. Yeah, yeah. so you're figuring it out yourself. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure it out along the way and um talking about the differences between the the culture of Chinese company and United States company, I do believe, you know, even for the, for the company in China, different companies have quite different cultures. But to say, if we can summarize something in general that, the, you know, you can see a dramatic difference between the Chinese and the U.S., I would say, you know, the work-life balance, you know, it's a, a little bit worse in China. <laughs> People are more aggressive. Yes. Uh, we're not talking about just startups. We're talking about even for the big corporations like Alibaba or uh, Tencent. You know, um, I think people are really, really into what they're doing, and they would love to put more effort, mm -hmm. put more resources into the work, other than the rest part of the life. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Probably because they see the huge opportunity in that moment, like give everything and then probably make it big, right? Th that's, a, that's a good point. If you're looking back for the last 10 years, I think, you know, if you look at the growth in China, th they have been uh, very, very impressive, right? So if you see opportunity where you put more effort and can, you can see the outcome right away, I think a lot of people will go that route. And I think that that's kind of the scenario in China right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the market is great because, the you know, they have like 1.6 billion people yeah. and, uh, and if you do this right, you can not only uh, influence the Chinese market, you can also go globally as well. So, yeah, this is a great time for the entrepreneurship. Yeah. Wow. Very exciting. So what do you think will be the killer app of AR that's going to make the whole thing like, yeah, more digestible to the general public? Okay, that's a hard question. <laughs> so uh, to be honest, uh, we have several answers in mind. Yeah. But if I be to give you one, that may be hard, but as I mentioned, we can, can give you several, several, say yeah. again, entertainment and productivity. Right. That's uh, I think the killer thing for the consumer. Uh, and for entertainment, if you look at what's 
what is consuming the most part of the, the people's time in the cell phones landscape, I think you can shift them onto the glasses and make them better. Say the movie watching experience, some kind of lightweight social gaming and uh, shopping. Uh, that would be something very, very interesting. But also for the productivity, say um, something you do on the, the cell phone that uh, say you can render some complicated model or uh, say auto autodesk adobe stuff like that i think they can be very very useful and interesting all as right well. so for both um consumer and enterprise you believe that might be exciting of course yeah of course yeah great amazing i know that your time is very limited so we're going we're getting we're going to the end right now okay and um yeah um i would like to say thank you so much for taking your time here at gdc i know you're very busy so thanks so much for talking with me in thank this you episode. for having me yeah it was very exciting and i wish you all the best for the unreal glasses and of course for your launch so i believe that we can all be very excited and um, yeah i'm going to cover the annual glasses on mrtv on my channel so you will definitely not miss when they go yeah when they go for sale hopefully worldwide soon okay thank you so much for joining this episode of people next hour thank you yeah so i hope you enjoyed this episode of people in xr as much as i did it if yes why don't you give it a thumbs up and of course why don't you leave a review in your podcast provider that's it and i'm looking forward to meet you in the next episode of people in xr <laughs>